most of Asia Pacific is turning the corner towards including tobacco harm reduction in public health policy, except for Australia, the last holdout of quit or die. We speak with Dr. Robert Beaglehole about New Zealand's smoke-free 2025 action plan and also give an update on what is going on in China. In this episode, we will do a deep dive into New Zealand's bold and progressive smoke-free 2025 action plan. We will do a brief summary on the situation in Australia and also provide information on the new proposed regulations in China and how that may affect the global vaping market. New Zealand is proposing some of the toughest anti-smoking laws in the world. New Zealand is cracking down on smoking in a way we've rarely seen on the planet. New Zealand has come up with a radical plan to phase out smoking. New Zealand has taken an historic step towards a smoke-free future. I think it's a good thing for our babies, eh? We see a little, like, a lot of um, young kids coming around, smokes in the hand, like, We'll say that they're like 9 to 14 years old. You're also good because um, you'll be healthier, more fitter. As you can see, I'm, I'm a bit chubby. The New Zealand Smoke Free Action Plan is based on two generation. main pillars. Which mean that no one aged older than 14 at the time the planned legislation comes into force will ever be able to legally purchase cigarettes. One is to outlaw the purchase of any tobacco products for anyone born after 2006. And the other concerns vapors and advocates alike. And that is to only have very low nicotine cigarettes available on the market from 2025. We want to know, what does this really mean for the future of nicotine in New Zealand? We thought it best to consult with Dr. Robert Beaglehole, Board Chair of Action on Smoking and Health New Zealand and former Director of the Department of Chronic Disease and Health Promotion at the World Health Organization. We asked him to answer a few questions that we have about the plan and the future of nicotine in New Zealand. Welcome, Robert, and thank you for taking the time to discuss the Smoke-Free 2025 Action Plan and hopefully allay some of the fears and concerns that consumers and advocates have around the plan. With regards to the plan, the proposal for very low nicotine cigarettes has many advocates and consumers worried. The concern is that with less nicotine, people will light up more to get the nicotine that they need, therefore causing more harm. What is your take on this? Well, I think this is an extremely interesting proposal. It has never been implemented anywhere else in the world, uh, which surprises me a little that the government would go for this because one of the things government ministers always say is, I don't want to be the first, show me the evidence that it works and what is it going to cost? So this would be an unprecedented uh, experiment at the population level. There are, of course, quite a few randomised controlled trials in particular, which have shown that in certain circumstances that it does help some of them uh, quit uh, traditional cigarettes, but, of course, many of them relapse. I, I guess there are, there are three possibilities. If we ever get to the point of having very low nicotine cigarettes as being the only available uh, smoking, cigarette smoking option, it might help some people stop. It might. Some, as you might say, will keep trying to smoke these things to get the nicotine that they are, uh, are dependent on, and this might have adverse effects because they'll get more and more of the toxic substances. And by removing the nicotine but re retaining the toxic substances, it gives the impression that nicotine is the problem. And of course, it is not the problem. Nearly 2 million cigarettes have been seized. Customs is catching around 125,000 smuggled cigarettes every month. And the third uh, possibility is very likely, in my view, that if you can't get the nicotine product that you're dependent on, uh, then you'll go to the black market. In terms of getting people to quit, I don't think it's going to work. 
I think more or less the crime rate and possibly black market tobacco industry is going to boom. With this proposal for very low nicotine cigarettes, there are also concerns that it is the beginning of the end for nicotine and that the ultimate goal is to eliminate it completely in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Well, I understand that concern. The government in its smoke-free action plan is deeply committed to vaping. Um, we've already seen vaping being used by people as a tool to stop smoking. And that actually enables us to, to push ahead with further activity re to, to reduce down smoking because there is an alternative that works very successfully um, for people in order to stop smoking. It's deeply committed to risk proportionate legislation and regulation. In terms of promoting vaping, uh, one item of the six in the smoke-free action plan is health information campaigns uh, to encourage more people to quit. And that together with the recognition of the role of vaping, I think can be, should be reassuring uh, to vapors. Hey sis, off the ciggies, on the vape, you're halfway there. And in terms of what the government is doing, they have, it seems, put on hold a very particular uh, program, Vape to Quit Strong, and it appears that that money is being used for a youth prevention, a vaping prevention program in youth. Now, I think we need to do both things. So I don't think, Nancy, I see any sign that the government is anti-nicotine. Uh, there are groups in New Zealand who give that impression, I think that's a mistake. Robert, there was an article in the New Zealand media, and I'd like to read it to you. A researcher stated, there would be almost certainly an escalation of vaping, but vaping is substantially less harmful than smoking, and vaping could be phased out after nicotine was banished. What is your reaction to that? Well, it, 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 it's possibly coming from an academic who is not well grounded in the realities of smoking and smoking cessation and the important role of vaping in helping some, a reasonable number of uh, cigarette smokers transition away. Um, given um, the government's committed to risk proportionate approaches, I don't think that's going to happen. And we should be doing everything we can to allow people, adults, smokers, make their own decisions about how they transition if they want to, how long they vape for, uh, whether they're both dual smokers and vapors, and if they need to vape for the rest of their life on nicotine, fine by me. I think that would be their choice at the present time with the information we have about the relative harms of cigarette smoking and, and vaping. So I think the idea that we're going to banish nicotine from this country is about as likely as we're going to banish uh, caffeine, coffee, or alcohol. Uh, but we have uh, some of the strongest laws in the world at present. In a complete 180 from their neighbors across the Tasman, and as the exception in the wider Asia-Pacific region where tobacco harm reduction is being embraced in countries such as Malaysia, the Philippines and even Thailand, Australia continues to foolishly embrace the quit or die mindset and have regulated for a prescription only model. Thus, making it more difficult for Australians to access what they need for vaping, forcing people back to smoking and, in turn, supporting a black market that will only cause more harm and risk to the population. In the recently issued consultation for the National Tobacco Strategy 2022-2030, to 2030, 
they propose additional measures to further restrict the marketing, availability, and use of all e-cigarette components. According to the document, Australia's precautionary approach is underpinned by the current state of evidence regarding the direct harms e-cigarettes pose to human health, their impacts on smoking initiation and cessation, uptake among youth, and dual use with conventional tobacco products. Dr. Colin Mendelson said of the proposal that the primary focus and goal of Australia's proposed vaping regulations is to protect children and young people without any consideration for the life-saving benefits of vaping for adult smokers. In Australia, it will remain much easier to buy deadly cigarettes than the far safer alternative. When will you authorise the vaping product alternative to allow Australians to be able to make that decision to stop killing themselves. What has occurred, I think, is a public health disaster, and uh, that is not something that on my watch I am willing to countenance. However, there is an election looming in Australia. I honour the House. And Greg Hunt will not be returning as Minister of Health. One can hope that something gives in the new government, but will it be business as usual? Time will tell, and we will keep you updated. When China amended its tobacco monopoly law in November 21 to include e-cigarettes, there were major concerns on how this would impact the global vaping market, as most of the manufacture of equipment and accessories for vapes is done in mainland China. China has previously imposed restrictions and bans for vape use in the country, so there were fears that having vaping under the control of the government-owned China Tobacco would mean restrictions on the global vape industry. However, equipment will still be produced by independent companies, and there should be no impact on exports, and therefore access on the global market. The restrictions to be implemented are internal within China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. We thank you for joining us, and join us next time where we will hopefully have an update on Malaysia, the Philippines, and possibly Thailand. We will also speak with Maria from Rights for Vapors in Canada about the situation there. Until next time, stay safe.